evolution will change from being a Darwinian evolution to a human controlled evolution. This gets back to the point I made earlier about, you know, we're at this inflection point where we don't have to be driven by our old brain, our old biology and our old evolutionary pressures. We can now choose our own future should we want to. Hi everyone, before we start, I want to take a minute to talk about my next book. You may have heard about the story of GameStop in January or February and thought it was all over. You're sadly mistaken. Unfolding Online has been a clash between the corrupt practices of Wall Street and the hive mind of the internet. It's a hot, raging information war pitting retail investors against financial giants swimming in corruption and fraud. The trailer is at the end of this podcast, but if you want to help crowdfund the book or just find out more, you can sign up to my mailing list to get access to a preview of chapter one or go to whenmoon.com to read more about the book. The first 200 people to pre-order the book will get a free pack of To The Moon crayons with their book. I just want to make a quick mention of our sponsors. Namecheap are one of the cheapest places on the internet to get a domain name for your next website. I've used Namecheap for all the sites I've ever purchased and I've found it really easy to use. Spreaker are a rapidly growing platform for podcast recording, publishing, and monetization with pricing plans as low as $7 per month. A cheap way to host your podcast and start earning from your back catalog of shows. Finally, ExpressVPN is the internet's most trusted VPN. Protect your privacy and watch and view content that is location locked you could even try watching Netflix from a different country. And right now, they're offering 35% off 12 months of ExpressVPN. Please use the links in the description below if you want to support the show. Anyway, here's the podcast. So hello and welcome to another episode of Chatter. Today, I am here with Jeff Hawkins, the American founder of Palm Computing and Handspring. He then turned his work to neuroscience full-time, founded the Redwood Center for Theoretical Neuroscience, and is the author of the brand new book, A Thousand Brains, A New Theory of Intelligence. Uh, Jeff, welcome to the show. Thanks, Josh. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's fantastic to, uh, to be able to chat to you. So um, the, I guess the, the first question for, for me is, is where, where this book began its, its conception. Like, where did it start for you? Well, I mean, all right, I'm going to give you two answers to that question. Uh, One, it started over 40 years ago because I fell in love with the idea that we can understand how our brain works, and I felt there was something we could do in our lifetime, so I've been working on that for for, for a long time. And this book is a culmination of uh, of what we've learned. Uh, The second answer is five years ago, we had uh, a real breakthrough in our research. (laughs) It was like the light went on, and all of a sudden, we could see all these things we didn't understand, uh, we now understood. And so... Uh, I felt compelled, um, uh, not only do we have to publish that in scientific papers, which we've done, um, but to publish it in a way that anyone could understand it, because uh, I think it's really an important thing to know. Mm-hmm. So uh, I guess it's not something that hits the headlines very often for most people. They, they don't they don't see, um, you know, it, oh, you know, scientists have developed um, all of this brand new information. So what was it like? Maybe more specifically, that that sort of the, come to light in the last. Um, what was what was the key years. insight that we had? Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. um, I in the book I write about several of these aha moments I had, and the last one I wrote about is this one. Um, it sounds so simple. It's it's, but that's like the beauty of it, right? Um, uh, the insight was uh, here's something we know. we've known for a long time that the brain is constantly making predictions. It's predicting, and you're not aware of most of these predictions. Uh, you're, you're not aware that your brain is actually predicting what it's going to see at every moment. It's trying to predict what it's going to hear at every moment. Uh, it's trying to predict what it's going to feel at every moment. It can't always do that, but it's constantly trying, and you're not generally aware of this. Okay. Um, and I was holding a cup. This is actually this cup right here. <laughs> it's like in the method coffee cup. And I was touching it one day, and I was thinking how my brain is predicting what it's going to feel when my finger... Um, touches the cup and and to do that the brain has to know something which i didn't realize and hardly anyone actually knew is that it has to know where the tip of my finger is relative to this cup it has to and this cup could be moving around right it could be anywhere it could be sideways upside down 
So internal to a small part of my brain has to know where the, my finger is, where is in what we, what we say the location on this cup, independent of where the cup is relative to my body. And that seems very simple, but it's actually a very profound insight. And uh, it tells us that everything in the brain, everything that the parts of the brain we study have this a sense of location. Um, and everything, every, there's a location where your fingers are, where your eyes are, where your body is. Um, but this explains, it goes much deeper than that. It explains uh, what thought is, how we store knowledge in our brain and so on. So that little insight about that there has to be a representation of location, which requires something we call a reference frame, um, was, uh, was the key and it just a flood of things happened after that. So it, I know it doesn't sound like exciting, but it tells us a, a, it tells us that everything in the brain is stored at locations, <laughs> it's internally in your head, and that the brain builds this model of the world that all built on these what we call reference frames. So it, it's complex, but I try to tease it apart, just walk it through slowly in the book. No, I mean, that's, that's definitely a, a, an insight that maybe people don't even realize like how big a leap it is because for, for years, anytime I've been reading or, or listening to anything about uh, people trying to understand the brain, it's been a case of they weren't even sure where a lot of things were happening, where a lot of the information was stored, and um, where you know, where the, the computation was taking yeah, place yeah. because uh, yeah because you yeah you can you can watch an MRI and watch things fire but yeah. that doesn't give you like an like a specific yeah you know, there's, there's a there was a discovery that happened many years ago which I wrote about in the book which even a lot of neuroscientists just sort of ignore but many understand it and and that is the, the part of the brain that's most associated with intelligence is the neocortex it's like three quarters of our brain it's a big wrinkly thing everyone sees right it, it's made of one hundred fifty thousand little columns so you can think about about the size of a grain of rice and 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 there's a famous scientist Brennan Mountcastle who said these things all look identical by the way these little grains of rice that make up your neocortex look identical and they're very complex but identical and and so but they do different things there's vision there's hearing there's language there's touch there's high level thought there's mathematics all everything we do is based on these little this neocortex and he said this Brennan Mountcastle said you know I think they're all doing the exact same thing um, and if you hook at this part of the neocortex up to an eye, you get vision. If you hook it up to the ears, you get hearing. If you hook it up to the output of other ones, you get language. He says, they're all doing the same thing. And there's a lot of evidence to support this, but it's, it's fantastical. It's like, how could everything we do be based on a, sing, a sim, simple little thing? It's about the size of a grain of rice, 150,000 of them. And, um, but no one knew what it was. And so what we kind of discovered, not kind of, we actually did, we discovered what that thing is doing. What is a sort of universal algorithm that could explain vision, hearing, touch, language, high level thought, and so on? Um, and it has to do with these, um, has to, as I mentioned earlier, the, the key to understanding what these, what we call cortical columns do, these little grains of rice, is um, they have an internal reference frame. It's like an XYZ coordinates. It's not, that's not what it is, but it's kind of like that. And, and they store everything at, at locations in these reference frames. And so we build a model of the world in our head. And it uses these reference frames with locations. Um, it's just it's very similar to the way we build models inside of a computer, like a CAD model, that uh, computer in a design model. If you have a model of a house in a computer, how do they do that? It's kind of like that in some ways. But we have 150,000 of these things, modeling, modeling systems in our head. So it's a, it's a totally different way of thinking about the brain than, than uh, people. Not completely, but enough different that most people weren't thinking about it uh, at all. You're right, there's a lot of confusion about this. And this insight, it really just, illuminates a tremendous amount. It's just so much of the complexity can be understood now. Um, so for me, it was a tremendous, um, exciting uh, uh, discovery. And um, I think it has, it's gonna have very large implications uh, for both AI and for education and the future of our, our species actually. So <laughs> actually, um one thing I, I, I was um, I'm so, uh, slightly unclear on is, uh, so you, you've got um, all of these like tiny little grains of rice, as you call them, the yeah. cortical columns all stacked up. Are they specifically assigned to different yeah. things? And are, are, even though they're the same sort of, they're, they're built as identically, yeah. or, or are they kind of like universally, do they have like universal no. utility? So like is, is one that's like working on your smell perhaps yeah. then able to be like repurposed by your brain yeah, yeah. or are they all like individual well it's I'll, that's it so when you're so imagine they're all lined up in this they're like imagine they're vertically stacked next to each other so there's a big sheet that's what your neocortex is 
it's like about the size of a large, um, I guess you, you'd say serviette, is that right? <laughs> Napkin, I'm not sure. Um, uh, yeah. and, um, uh, and it's about, it's about two and a half millimeters thick. And it just, that's what it is. Now, in, the, in your brain, in my brain, the output of the eye projects to one section and the output of the ears projects to another section. The output of the skin projects to another section. And other uh, parts of the neocortex get inputs from uh, other parts of the neocortex. So they are assigned this wiring diagram at birth. Um, and, and so, you know, at birth, there's an a area dedicated to vision. But what we know, um, first of all, they all look the same. So that was the puzzling part. Like, how can vision be the same as language? They don't seem like they're the same thing, but the, the underlying circuitry is the same. And then we also know that if you have damage to your brain or if you're blind or you're, there's other sort of trauma that might occur, that the brain can reposition it, they re, re, repurpose it. And so uh, people who are born congenitally blind, the part of the neocortex that normally does vision does something else. It, it, the brain figures out, oh, well, I'm not getting any input from the eyes, let's try something else. And so it rewires itself. So it's a bit of both. It's like we're, we're, these things are, you know, we have an architecture. We're not just a big soup of these things up in your head. It's, there's an architecture we're born with um, and things are connected in a certain way, but it's also pretty flexible. And if you, if, if the brain needs to, it can re rewire uh, it up to an extent. That's also just a fascinating little piece uh, that, that the brain is like physically capable of, of rewiring itself, even even at like a, a really low level. That's I find that. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. And this is why you like, like oh, the, people don't. Yeah. If, this is why if you have a if you have a, a stroke or something like that over the next four months, you can recover a lot of abilities because what's literally happening, the, 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 the neurons are sending their signals saying, I'm going to try over here. I'm going to try over here. It's called neuroplasticity. Um, you can only do it up to a point, you know, you, you can't recover everything, but, um, but it's, it's quite flexible. In fact, throughout our lives, every, every day when we learn and learn new skills or, or do things, uh, our brain is kind of re constantly rewiring, uh, try, trying to figure out the best uh, configuration. It's pretty amazing. I love there was a, there's a, a Jordan Peterson lecture on um, personality and he was talking about how when you, we take and experience new things that our brain is literally like creating new pathways and we're not just like mentally changing ourselves like in some esoteric sense yeah. but it's like actually physically happening. It's physically rewiring. Uh, I know it's, it's, it's actually, if you, there's people who've shown the extent of this and it's amazing. <laughs> it's like your brain can really rewire. I mean, not a hundred percent. It's not like this, you know, bowl of spaghetti that you can just, you know, but it's, um, it, uh, you know, there, it used to be people, many years, decades ago, people thought the brain was pretty static that, you know, once you're born, that's it. And the idea now that it's very plastic is the term. Um, it's very plastic. It's constantly, we're constantly getting new neurons or constantly rewiring. It's constantly trying to figure out what the best configuration is. Um, and so we're, we're not, uh, you know, we're not static. Mm. So uh, th this kind of brings me, brings us nicely on to like one of the biggest questions I kind of had for you. Okay. And, and it's something that I have been thinking about sort of on and off for a while. I remember getting really fascinated by the idea um, when Sam Harris was talking about the, the capabilities of artificial intelligence. Um, and I, essentially, if, if we're capable at some point in the future of like, building and replicating like a human mind, body, sort of nervous system even as well. It's like, do you think it would think like a person? Because I, I know you had this discussion um, with, with Lex a little bit. And I, I was I was really sort of perplexed by the by this question. It's like if if we built something that was basically a brain in like in an engineering sense. Yeah. Would it act? Would it would it process and think like a person, or is there like something else that's that's not tangible and like the feeling of, or the the idea of being alive or yeah. some sort of non measurable force yeah. that's making our brain work the way it does? Well, it, a lot of people would like to believe the latter, you know, um, but the evidence we have is really clear. Um, and at the moment, there doesn't appear to be any sort of non tangible, you know, mysterious force going on. And in, from my perspective, we understand this well enough that we can actually build machines that work, not like the entire brain. No, I, I don't know if anyone who wants to build a human within human nervous system, but we do want to build machines that work like the neocortex and they will think. Um, I, I talked about, I have a chapter in my book about this, about machine consciousness, what it takes to be conscious. Uh, and, uh, but it is a process that 
that we can make machines have. It's not, it's, it sounds, many people think it's mysterious, but it's from my perspective, it's not, not so much. And, um, and so, yes, machines will think they will think I, they won't be like us. They're not going to look like us. They're not going to act like us. I make the big distinction. We don't want machines having our emotions and our drives. We, you know, there's nothing about recreating animals or humans, but can a machine that recreates the neocortex and a few other parts of the brain think and, and be aware that it's thinking? Absolutely. Um, and there is no, um, there is no missing life force or, you know, consciousness sauce that you need <laughs> to do that. It's, it can be all understood in terms of normal biology, chemistry, and physics. We can talk about it if you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, like the, the, the thing, the thing that makes that, that interests me uh, about, about this like particular part is that is, is, is death the thing that is driving our brains forward and the, the kind of desire in, in some ways to, to procreate. Like I know in, I can't remember the, who the quote is from, but the, they said that the entire like human intellect is like an elaborate mating ritual and that the, all of these like very, these drives of, of wanting to, to, you know, create the next generation, knowing that yeah. we're eventually going to die yeah. is the thing that has driven our minds to, yeah create a wonderful brilliant things it's like the the reason that J.R.R. Tolkien cites in the Lord of the Rings that the elves don't do very much is because they're they've not been blessed with a with a ticking clock in the same way that like men have in the in the in the book like that's but that's that's the way they think about it and I, I think it's a really interesting way of looking at well, like, why I, I, minds yeah work. I have a very specific I mean I, I developed this idea in the third part of the book quite in that fact it's I think it's one of the most important things I write about in this book um, here's how I think about it. Humanity, we're, you know, we're, I, I'm, I'm a rationalist, right? We just, we're animals. We evolve like other animals. Um, and we uh, have all this evolutionary baggage and history, right? And so everything, everything we have right now in our bodies is, was there to serve our genes in some sense, to serve our recre procreation. But what's happened is we're the first species that has developed a brain that is able to understand the bigger picture. We're the first species that understand that we're living on the earth and that the earth revolves around the sun and that the universe is big. We're the first species on this planet to know how we got here through evolutionary forces and the, and the mechanisms of biology. No other animals know this. Not, they have no clue about any of this stuff. And, and we are the first people who can sort of see into the future and see what you know, the future might hold for our species, for our planet, climate change, whatever. And no, no one of the animals are worried about this stuff. So, and what, in some sense, this all started with the process of what we call the, the enlightenment, right? And we started realizing, oh my God, we can understand the world. And we're now at this cusp where we're, we're still this animal that has all these drives, right? We still want to have sex, we need to eat, we don't want to die and all this stuff. This is all the service of genes. That's it, this doesn't, there's no other purpose to it. But we also have this intellect. And the intellect itself enjoys knowledge and enjoys speaking like, oh, look, I'm a, you know, it's too bad I have this, you know, body that's getting old and too bad, you know, and here's how we got here. But, and, um, yeah. and so we have this point where we can ask ourselves, you know, what is the future of our, of ourselves? What's the future of our species? Do we want to continue to be driven by these biological necessities of evolution and procreation? Uh, or do we want to change the future to serve um, our knowledge and our intellect? And that's a very profound question. Um, and I talk a bit about the different things we can do um, if we wanted to really preserve our, ourselves as not as a biological species, but us as an intellectual species. Uh, so I think it's a fascinating question. Um, and I think we have, we're just at the cusp of being able to do things like modify our genes and you know, create intelligent machines and, and you know, solve all these diseases and, 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 and and live on other planets and so on that we now can ask ourselves, do we want to continue being uh, driven by these biological forces? Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to quote and then paraphrase uh, Eric Weinstein here for a second. So he said that we are gods, but for the wisdom. Um, and he's, yeah, <laughs> which is, I think it's a beautiful quote. Well, we've <laughs> become gods recently. I guess is the idea, right? You know, with the technology. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, I guess that's what he's getting at. But then he, he also asks um, like a similar question 
um, to to sort of that leads on from that that quote, and it's he, he's talking more specifically about our understanding of like physics and the universe. But I think it applies equally uh, to our attempt to understand like the mechanisms of our own mind. He says, "What happens when we crack our own source code? Like when we understand how our brains are working? Is that a leap that then we can? Is that like a dangerous place to go to?" for for humans like are we capable of yeah of, you know of well, handling the knowledge of how it works well the problem is right and and i agree with that it's a real challenge because we have now not, you know we not only cracked our code but we've made nuclear weapons we're, we're we're creating you know heating up the planet because we're so smart right you know but we're still <laughs> but we're still driven by these old um you know emotions and drives that is very hard to shake and so now we're we're like uh, yes, I think, you know, we're like gods in the sense, uh, I'm, I'm reading into that quote, where in the sense that we've been able, we can create the world and modify in ways that actually could be very, very detrimental to us if we're not careful. And yet at the same time, we are able, not at, not able to be wise all the time because we do stupid things because, we're, you know, we're humans and uh, we're animals. Um, and that is a real challenge. I mean, this is, the, there's a question, you know, do intelligent species survive? Because when they get intelligent, they create the means of their own destruction, and yet they're not able to control it very well. So I think there's there. I don't I don't want to be a pessimist. I'm not saying that we can't do this, we can't survive, and so on. But it is a real risk, right? You know, <laughs> it's a real risk. We, yeah. we, you know, we've got nuclear weapons. Now we've got climate change. You know, we can create uh, uh, diseases that could wipe out humanity. Um, so who knows? Um, but we do have an opportunity to, as you know, I think. One of the benefits of creating intelligent machines, which we're going to do, um, we're in the process of doing it, is is we can now embody our intelligence in a system that doesn't have those same failings. And some people get worried about it. They say, "Oh, these machines will be just like us." And I said, "No, they won't. They're not going to like us at all. They're not. Gonna, it'll be just the opposite. We'll have the wisdom um, uh, without the, the the old stuff, if you will." <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it is a, it's a very fascinating part of time to be living. Um, because we're we're at this crux where we're transitioning from being just another animal species to one that can actually um, really change the world in very dramatic ways. Is there a case that you give any credence to to not do this? Essentially, to like put the brakes on things. Like, is there any any argument that you've heard that that well, I, I you think in any way? It, there are there are many things to worry about, and so we have to be careful. Um, I'm I'm not a believer, and I make I make a very co I hope cogent arguments in the book. I don't worry about us creating intelligent machines that are going to take over and subjugate us or murder us or something. I just it, this is nonsense, and I know a lot of smart people think this is going to happen, but they don't know much about brains. And when you know a lot about brains, you realize and how you can build intelligent machines. You just know that this is not going to happen. It's not something that we're going to be surprised about. Like, oh my God, I created this machine, and all of a sudden it, it's it's alive and it wants to take over. It's not going to happen. And I, I walk through the arguments for that in the book. But it is a, going to be another very powerful technology and intelligent machines. And I and I worry about humans abusing it. Um, you worry about, you know, we're already seeing in today's AI, which is very limited, how it could be used to manipulate people's minds, how it could be used for discrimination, um, how it could be used for murdering people. I mean, any powerful technology is dangerous. And we have to, we, we have so far as a species decided not to, you know, stop and regress. We, we've decided we're going to keep going forward and try to deal with these issues. And so I think as we go forward with intelligent machines, we have to be very careful about, uh, you know, can we can we get international agreements about how they're used in the same way as we did with chemical weapons? Um, can we have agreements about safety protocols and so on? Um, uh, but it's it's it'd be like saying, do we want to go back before you know we had the computers or the internet? Well, I don't think anyone really wants to do that. Those are powerful technologies, right? <laughs> Dude, we're going to want these things. We're going to love having intelligent machines. Uh, it's going to make life really really cool and interesting. Uh, but we'll have to deal with the with the risks associated with it. So I don't, I don't think we should stop. I, you know, it's not like, do we want to stop learning? I don't want to stop learning. <laughs> I don't want to do that. No. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I like to, there's, there's like a part of me that likes to fantasize about what it would have been like to grow up in the sixties, you know, before <laughs> all the technology ruined everything. But then, 
you know, I couldn't, I couldn't do a lot of the things that I get to do now. I couldn't speak to people on the other side of the world, uh, like fantastic experts like yourself. Uh, my information wouldn't be like at my fingertips. I'd have to go to the library and go and figure some stuff out. Yeah. Because I did grow up barely in the sixties, and uh, it's hard to go back and think, how did I do this stuff? <laughs> like, you, know, you get in the car, you want to go someplace. Like, oh yeah, we had the paper maps. And, and we used to have arguments about it all the time about reading the paper map. No one would agree about it. You know, oh, you forgot this. It's like pretty funny. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we get very, very dependent. We are. Yeah, my, well, it, one of my, yeah, we yeah. are. It's, it's it maybe a little scary. Yeah. So do you think that um, either, like, you can go as philosophical as you want on the answer to this question, but do you think there's a difference between um, knowledge, intelligence, and wisdom uh, in terms of, like, how our brains process information and, and how they, yeah, yeah, store and utilize that? Like, do, do you think there's, like, a physical difference between those three things? Well, and do you think it's possible to even code for that in a machine that we would build? Yeah. So let me, I mean, those are words that are, are poorly defined. Um, so I do think about this, and um, but let me... By answering your question, I'm going to try to define them as I use them, okay? So let's use the word intelligent, like is something intelligent? Um, and and I think I have a very clear answer to that question, is something intelligent? Not. Intelligence in a machine or an animal or human is our ability to learn a model of the world in our head, meaning we, we literally create a model of all the things we know that exist in the neurons in our head. In some sense, we live in this virtual model. You know, when we look out at the world, we actually are, what we're perceiving is our model. We're just, I know it sounds crazy, but um, we're perceiving our model. And so anyway, intelligence is the ability to learn a model of the world. Humans are pretty intelligent because our model is very sophisticated. Our model includes things we can't see or feel or hear. So I have models of the universe or space or galaxies. I've never seen a galaxy. I've seen pictures of them. Um, I've never been to the city of Havana, but I believe it exists. I know a lot about it. Um, so I have a model in my head. It's much richer than I can just experience myself. And so intelligence is our ability, any, any system's ability to learn a model of the world. And, um, and that's, that's what intelligence is. Now, knowledge is what we populate in that model. It's like, what does our model consist of? I know some things about brains that you don't know. You know some things about broadcasting and media that I don't know. Um, so we have different sets of knowledge, even though we're both intelligent species. Uh, and our brains might have been very, very similar when we started. Um, but you have different experiences. You learn different things. So knowledge is that's accumulated. It is the, it is the content of that model. In our head. And um, I don't usually use the word wisdom. Um, but if I were, I would say it's, um, it's the ability to apply accumulated knowledge. So assuming you have a good model of the world, not a bad model. Because you can have a bad model. You can have an incorrect model of the world. Um, you know, I, I believe the Earth is round. I don't believe it's flat, right? So I might be wiser than someone who believes the world is flat, but the Earth is round. It's not flat. So, um, uh, but wisdom is, is sort of a being able, ability to apply uh, your model of the world to, uh, to actions in your, your everyday life. Um, but there's a distinction between uh, intelligence, which is just a, ability to learn a model, and knowledge which is the actual what you have learned. Um, and knowledge could be, as I said, you can have false models of the world. We all do. Uh, some have more than others. Like all we can do is approximate the world. You know, we don't really know the exact universe. We can only, we can only know some of it and uh, we can model it in, in some ways, it, but we can't know the, the ultimate truth of everything. So you're, you're your theory is called the the thousand brain theory of intelligence yeah. it's essentially that like we are i've heard you like talk about it sort of in in terms of like we're made up of of like a thousand different brains all calculating something and that sort of like summation comes together to make what is our our like brain and understand or like our our yeah, yeah. Our brain essentially and i'm curious as to whether you think that this is uh, like the, the, this model of the human brain can be like a microcosm for like the accumulated knowledge of like a, of humanity as a whole, mm. like whether, whether we can be considered almost like a hive mind, yeah. uh, as, uh, and that each in, 
in the way that all of the the little cortical columns um, yeah. sort of come together to make up our intelligence can all of the people in society or as in humanity come together to make it make our collective knowledge yeah. or wisdom intelligence I, I think that's a, a great a that's mind. a great observation and and it there is i i imagine there's some parallels there um, so the thousand brain theory refers to the fact, remember, those brains are rice, those little columns, right? They're all separate modeling systems. So the thousand brains theory says that if I ask myself, where is knowledge about something like my cell phone? I know a lot about my cell phone, right? Um, and so do you. And, and where is that knowledge? Well, it's not in one place. It's in many models, independent models. The, these models will actually work independently, but then they vote, to, they communicate. And that's a lot like a society, right? We're all intelligent beings and we run around and we don't just, well, sometimes we vote, but we do communicate. And we reach sort of a, a, um, a sort of mutual consensus on some things. Um, so that's a, it's a very a, it's a very parallel type of um, construction there. In fact, there's a, I'm speaking at a, a scientific conference uh, at the end of this month. It's at a place called the Santa Fe Institute, which studies um, the science of complexity. And the workshop they're running is on this very topic. Is on the topic of communal intelligence. Like how do we how do multiple people work together? Um, to reach a, a broader understanding. And I'm, I'm speaking about the neocortex because it is parallel, just like you said. It's a similar type of thing. We have these things voting. Um, I, I haven't thought about it a lot, so I, I'm just nodding my head with you. So, yeah, I think that's right. It's something similar to that. But I haven't really studied, like, you know, communal intelligence or the hive, you know, brain or something like that. Um, it, I've been so deep in just looking at the, the neocortex itself. But in many ways, it is... Uh, very parallel, very similar. Um, you know, we really have these lots of little brains in our head, thousands and thousands of them that are that are they're trying to do their own thing, but they have to communicate with each other. You know, there's a if you probably heard that you know, there's these split brain patients where they they can cut the connections between the left and right side of the brain. When you do that, the different problems on both sides can't talk to each other anymore, and now you have two brains. Uh, and those people who have a, you know they have the corpus callosum cut, uh, they literally have t two separate thought streams going. <laughs> one only one can speak, but but so it's it's like that would be like you know you have a city and now all of a sudden you don't let the north side of the city and the south side of the city talk to each other. They're going to continue on uh, something like that. <laughs> yeah, they definitely. I definitely think that's that's a possibility. Do you think that the the internet as as such is is like helping to? Um, and I know you said you haven't thought about this too deeply, but do you think the internet is is providing a way for us to? to increase the extent to which humans can act a, like a brain in, in this kind of the yeah. theory that I've laid out. Well, I assume that, Like, has that increased, oh, like, totally. the neuroplasticity of, of, of the society? Yeah, of course it has. Uh, I mean, I mean, language itself was this amazing invention, right? If, if before language, and any kind of language, you know, you think there's lots of animals that don't have language, all you could know is what you personally observed. That's it. You couldn't know anything else. If, if I wondered what's on the other side of a mountain, I couldn't know unless I went there. Even if my, my neighbor animal went there, they had no way of telling me what they knew. So language, for the first time, let us understand things that um, we didn't personally experience. And, of course, now the Internet allows us to get this information, you know, like a fire hose. Right? You, just, you can find out anything. You can just say, I want to know more about this. And bingo, you'll find out more about it. Uh, where in the past you had to search out some expert and talk to them and, or read a book or, you know, find someone. Um, so it's really accelerated this sort of sharing of information. I don't know how we act as a whole. It's, I mean, I, I understand how it does in the brain, but I don't, I don't, our society, you know, the society have its own desires and goals or something like that. I don't know. Uh, but I can definitely say that uh, we, as individuals, we have we mutually reinforce uh, our our knowledge because I share with you things I know and you share with me things you know. You're not going to broadcast this to many thousands of listeners, and they'll learn something. Um, so uh, the internet is definitely accelerating this. I, I like to say the, the the internet and communications is accelerating the accretion of knowledge, um, and it's whether it's a hive mind I don't know. <laughs> it's accelerating the, the, you know, our, our collection of knowledge dramatically, um, and I think it's exciting, personally. Yeah, it's definitely very exciting. Uh, do you think that our brains are still evolving in a way? Because so at, at the minute, we've got 
um, like the, the hippocampus, and then you've got everything sort of built on top yeah. right up to the neocortex. And uh, one thing that a lot of people talk about um, when they're considering like uh, ancient philosophers and whatnot and, and trying to understand like early humans and how our brain is the same as it was however many tens or hundreds of thousands of years ago. And the, the general conclusion that I've seen is that people that, that is that our brains haven't changed a lot in 200,000 years um, or 150,000 years, roughly. Mm. Do you think that our minds are still changing and evolving and do you think that will be affected by our understanding of it and yeah. is it possible for us to influence how our minds develop further as yeah. we sort of grow as a species first of all, I, I would challenge that idea a bit that you know we haven't evolved much in two hundred thousand years i don't think we know okay we just don't know um okay. if you think about evolution the way darwin described it it's a very slow process but there's a lot of very smart people who study evolution and biology who think that it's it's um, it, they're, they're, it can happen much quicker. It, it's not just like um, I'm reading a book by Stuart Kaufman called The Origin of Order, and he talks about this. It, it, like the bottom line of all this is that sometimes evolution can happen very rapidly. It thinks and change very quickly, and um, so it's not clear to me just because our brains may be the same size they were 200,000 years ago that they haven't evolved. So we just don't know. I think we just have to say we don't know. But if, even if we assume that um, evolution is continuing, sure, uh, but it's now under different pressures, right? You know, in the past, we'd all be starving and, um, you know, literally that would be the normal situation <laughs> and uh, trying to live and, and not die young and have kids. Um, and so it was a very brutal world. And now, you know, we, we don't have those same pressures now. That's different. And so um, I don't know what the evolutionary pressures are now, but clearly um, it's still going on. It, it's probably going slow. We're not seeing anything big happening right now. But I think it's far more likely that we will be able to modify ourselves, basically modify our genes directly, very rapidly in the near future. I mean, we know how to do this from a technology point of view. Um, whether we want to allow people to do it, it's a separate question. Uh, I think we will ultimately, and uh, we don't really know how to modify our genes, but it's going to be, seems to me within the next, you know, in decades or hundreds of years, we will, people will be readily modifying our genes. And, and if you want to call that evolution, go for it. it's not Darwinian evolution, um, but it's, it's a continued modification of our gene pool. Uh, and it's very easy to slip into this. It's like saying, well, would I want to prevent my kids from having some deadly disease if they're going to inherit? Well, of course I would. I wouldn't want them to have that. So let's make that modification. Well, you know, I, do I want to make sure they're not too small or too tall? Because that's bad for your health too. Okay, let's do that. You know? <laughs> and before you know it, we're like, okay, let's dial in the brain, you know? <laughs> um, so I, you know, some, some people think that's terrible. I think it's almost inevitable we're going to do these things. So evolution will change from being a Darwinian evolution to a human controlled evolution. This gets back to the point I made earlier about you know, we're at this inflection point where we don't have to be driven by our old brain, our old biology, and our old evolutionary pressures. We can now choose our own future should we want to. I know some people... Do you think that's still... Yeah. Do you think that's still technically like a natural selection, survival of the fittest way? Because if we can all change things individually, then the most successful of those changes will be the ones that become uh, like endemic or, or, yeah. or become like the most widely used. Is that still like, I don't, you know, evolution? I don't know. It's interesting because, you know, in the past success was reproduction. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, so think about it from a genes perspective, you know, uh, a, a gene doesn't really want to do anything, but a gene would, you know, it, it, a success to a gene would be that it gets created over and over again. That's this Darwinian evolution. However, imagine humans modify a gene. We create a new gene. And you can decide if you want to put that into your children's uh, DNA. Okay. So we're not, that replication of that gene is not dependent on biological procreation. It's just dependent on some human deciding, I want that gene versus some other gene. <laughs> and so you could argue, I think what you're saying, Josh, is you could argue um, that that's a type of natural selection. It's, it's a little bit like, you know, computer programs have a natural selection. Which ones do you, which apps do you download on your phone? Well, that's, yeah, that's a Darwinian evolution, right? Like some do better than others and some die out. Um, so, so genes may still be evolving, but we'll be controlling the evolution. And, 
Um, and which ones are successful? The ones we choose, not the which ones that just pre prevent us from starving. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's crazy. I know. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, so when when someone like so you you've come up with the this brand new theory of intelligence. Um, uh, so what what person like how do we how do we put like your theory of intelligence to the test essentially? Well, what's the model for for uh, like accurately assessing, and I'm sure you've probably done. Sure. Well, uh, we can do that. A lot well, the question like we want to verify it from a from a biological point of view is one thing, and then um, it can also be put to the test because we can build machines that work like this, and um, mm -hmm. that's another type of test. Is it does it do what we think it's going to do, and is it going to be useful, and does it, you know? <laughs> um, so, uh, from a biological point of view, there are many predictions that come out of this, um, quite a few, and. Uh, we have already uh, listed several of those in our papers. Um, I'm writing a paper right now, which I'm coming up with a whole bunch more. Uh, some of these have already been, uh, well, there's, there's early evidence suggesting that they've already been um, proven to be true. So one of the examples, is, I'll just get a little technical here, neuro, neuro, neuro nerdy, okay? <laughs> there's a type of cell in um, a part of the brain. The, these cells are called grid cells. And they exist in a part of the brain called the entorhinal cortex. It's an older part of the brain. And this is a heavily studied field. So two people won Nobel Prizes for discovery of grid cells. Um, so one of the predictions was, of our theory, is that grid cells will exist throughout the neocortex, that every part of the neocortex will have grid cells. This is how it's that reference frame I mentioned earlier. Um, they, they, they represent the location of something. And so um, when we made this prediction, we were not aware if anyone had ever suggested it or found it. Uh, and now there's there's accumulating evidence that grid cells exist in both the, the first and the prefrontal cortex. Now they found them in the, in the visual cortex and the somatocentric cortex. And I'm very confident they're gonna find them everywhere. That's a very strong and uh, unexpected prediction of the theory. Uh, there's lots of them like that. So we don't do the experimental, we're theorists. You know, we don't do experimental work. You can't tell experimentalists what to do. Uh, you can just say, here's something you might want to interested in testing. And they were they were doing this stuff anyway. I don't think these people discovered grid cells in the near project because of us, but but we did predict that. And um and it was a, a and I think it's uh, we're not done with that yet, but I think we'll find that that's the kind of thing. So there's lots of predictions like that. Um this is um, you know, this is not crazy made up science. This is very testable. There's lots of supporting evidence for the theories we come up with. So so the the grid cells, like the 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 very sort of vague, um, at least implication that, that my brain springs to when you when you talk about the idea that, that there is like a a reference grid or or you know a X Y Z axis, like for for lack of a, a better way of of understanding it, uh, that almost all the information it seems is somewhere in the brain. Like, is there a way to better like help our brain access the grid cells so yeah. that we could recall yeah. more knowledge yeah. or more information yeah, yeah. so I wrote about this so it's, it's really fascinating so it's easy to understand this idea of a reference frame when you're trying to imagine like well how do i you know how does my brain build a model of this cup right well the cup has got things relative to each other i need to know that the handle is on the side and not on the top and the top has a you know there's a shape to this thing right and to learn that shape, it's really helpful to have a reference frame. So that's pretty obvious. And you can do the same thing with vision and you can even do it with hearing. Like I know where sound is and whether it's moving, things like that. But what about high level thought, right? You know, how could this all explain all these high level thought? Well, the evidence is very clear that the different parts of the neocortex, whether no matter what they're doing, including the ours right now, they're doing language, um, they look similar. And so there's gonna be reference frames everywhere. So what it, what it made us realize is that all knowledge, everything we know is stored in a reference frame, in reference frames. Now let's take an example of like the house you live in or the flat you live in. Um, you have a model of that in your head and you know where things are and you, and you can recall the, that, those things. You can't think of them all at once, but you can imagine walking from room to room. And as you enter a room, you can look to the left and look, you can imagine looking to the left, looking to the right and what you'll see. And so what you're doing is you have a model of, of, of your, your house 
you recall it by moving through, literally mentally moving through the locations of that house. Well, it turns out all knowledge, I believe, is stored this way, everything. Now, it may not make sense, like, well, how do I store knowledge about, you know, freedom in, in, in a reference frame? Well, that's a trick. The brain has to figure out how to do that. And when it comes to things like um, conceptual knowledge, you still recall it by mentally going from location to location and recalling the information stored there. I can't think of all the things at once. But we may have different reference frames. It's possible that two people can take the same facts and arrange them in different reference frames, and they have different beliefs about it. Um, and so I use the example of history. I can take a set of historical facts and I can arrange them on a timeline, which gives me, I say, okay, that's a reference frame. A timeline's a kind of reference frame. And I say, oh, well, these things must be causally related because they happen close to each other in time. Or I could take the same set of facts and arrange them on a map. And then I'd have a different reference frame, the map, and I'd have different beliefs about causality. I say, oh, well, maybe these things happen um, here because they were near each other in space. Um, so both of those could be right. The problem we have with humans, or problem, it's a challenge, is that we can take the same set of facts and individually we can learn them in different reference frames. We can organize them differently and we come up with different beliefs about the same set of facts. But the theory explains how all this happens. Um, and so when we talk about like educating ourselves or how do we deal with this, we should at least be aware that learning something is not just a, 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 like a list of facts. It's how we organize it. It's like some teachers may put the, the facts of history on a timeline, some may put them on a map. But at least we should be aware that when you do so, you're changing how we think about those facts. And the same thing can occur when we learn facts about freedom. What are the contexts I'm using it? What are the metaphors? What's the physical metaphor I'm using for discussing uh, what freedom is? Um, I'm not saying we know all this yet. We don't. We don't know how to, I don't know how to teach kids, <laughs> right? But I do know how knowledge is stored in the brain. And you just, Having that additional information about what knowledge is and how you retrieve it, what it means to retrieve information, like walk, imagining walking to your house, um, is, it gives us at least the tools that we can start uh, doing better at this and, um, and, and making sure we use best practices uh, and understand how we can go wrong. Do you think that the, the, the people who have like incredible recall skills, uh, whether like learned or sort of just naturally, like say people who have like a photographic memory, does their brain then have like a better understanding of how to find like the information? Is it like, is their, is their brain's like subconscious understanding of like the grid May, in their mind yeah. better? I don't think so. I mean, if you look at like um, what are called savants who can learn very rapidly and huge, you know, incredible, some people are just incredible amount of details they can remember. You know, like they read a book and they can tell you every single page you know, where the words are. Um, yeah. This and their brains don't look substantially different than your mind, by the way. Right? You know, you don't open them up and find you know some other type of <laughs> antimatter in there or something, right? Um, yeah. so, um, it just shows that. Uh, but what what those people do, they tend to not generalize well. They get all the facts, but they don't see the connections as well. That's a uh, that would be a general statement. Um, about them. So I think there seems to be this sort of trade-off a little bit between, you know, facts themselves can make you blind to the patterns underlying them. And um, and so uh, I don't think having great recall of facts is necessarily makes you better at anything other than recalling facts. <laughs> I'm not sure it makes you worse at anything either, but uh, with savants of really extreme cases, it seems to make them less able to generalize. But I think for normal humans, I don't think I could say much about it. I can just say some people are a little bit on the spectrum of remembering more facts. Um, I am not one of those people. I can't remember anything, um, but I do generalize pretty well. Uh, so, you know, that's that helps me in my work. Uh, but um, but I think you know we're, it's, there's a spectrum across here, and I, I don't think I would want to um, in normal humans want to really put much value in it. It's just you know some of us. Are better remembering facts than others, and some maybe are better at generalizing than others. Do you think that that trade off that you've talked about is is it's like a, a universal rule of how uh, uh, like an in intelligent or like a mind mm. or a computer sort of like couldn't can like well, function? Well, is that yeah. like is 
is it like a, a a problem of like space in our own brains or is that like a general rule that's for an intelligence? question first of all, you know, we're really speculating here john so this anyone listening to this we have to realize yes. that like, <laughs> we don't know the answer to these questions but you know we can speculate mm. um i have something i do i find it's very interesting i often um if i'm working on a problem i often get the solution in the middle of the night and what i do is i i wake up in the middle of the night and i won't stir i won't turn on the light i won't do anything I'll just lie there and I'll think about it. And, and this kind of sort of lucid state, you know, it's like semi, not really sleeping, but not really 100% awake. And often I get the, the answer to a problem I've been stymied on will come to my into my head. And I've always felt like that's an evidence to your question that um, it's possible to, that we can, under certain states of consciousness or certain states of awareness, we can move that needle a bit. Right. We can say, you know, no, it's not hardwired. There's no hard rule here. Um, you know, you know, and so when I think about building intelligent machines, I think it'll be likely in the future that we can build a intelligent machine that both knows huge amounts of facts like a savant, but also can be brilliant at generalizing and extracting out information. And that humans were a little bit limited in, in what we, you know, I have to do tricks like waking up in the middle of the night, you know, <laughs> but, but, um, but you know, machines, when we really understand these processes, uh, it seems that we can, that will be a dot, you know, you can just turn it up and down. And it gives me the, it gives me the hope that sometime in the future, our, our intelligent machines will be very, very helpful for us in figuring out the mysteries of the world. Um, they will be able to think much better than we are and, and speculate better and be better theorists. Um, they'll know a lot more and they'll be able to cleverly think of solutions. Um, so I don't find that scary. I find that exciting, but some people find that scary. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a little scary. Um, but so then, yeah. Do you think, think that competing yeah. with this machine? If, if this machine is like, you know, like, like looks like your cell phone in your pocket, right? Well, and it's just helping you. Why, why do you care? You know? <laughs> it's like, mm, that's a good point. Yeah, you know, it's not like, I mean, it's yeah, not like I guess... some big brother looking down and go, Josh, I figured something out, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I guess, that, yeah, that goes full circle back to people's fear of intelligent machines sort of then developing their own, um, yeah, the... their own ideas about how... People thought yeah, that about like, computers well... too, you know, right? They thought that when computers were first invented, they thought, oh, this is a brain, it's going to be smart, it's going to, you know, they had the same fears back then. Um, didn't happen. Mm. Yeah, but do you, what? So then, so yeah, to 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 wrap things up here uh, and bring bring things uh, full circle. Like, what do you think the main implications for humanity are now that we have this new theory of of intelligence? Like, what is what is the 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 takeaway from it for for us as a, well, as I a think species and it, maybe it, for yeah. Yeah, your field in in the next? Let's say for the rest of this century, okay, so the next eighty years or so. Um, we're going to build very intelligent machines. They are going to transform our world in the same way that the computers did in the, in the 19th, you know, last century. And um, it, it'll be very transformative. And um, in the same way as computers were transformative, but probably even more so. Uh, it's very hard to know exactly how that's going to play out. No one could figure out how computers are going to play out. No one in 1940 could envision it, the internet or GPS or cell phones. I mean, none of this could, and we can't, we can't envision it either. But I think what our discoveries and what we're working on now is they really put a path. They show us how to make intelligent machines. They show us what intelligence is and how to make intelligent machines, what they will do, how they will work. It's no longer like, oh, someone's going to figure this out. It's like, no, I think we know how to do this now. Um, a lot of things we have to work out, a lot of engineering problems, but there's a very clear roadmap. We even talked about it. We published it. We presented it at conferences. Um, and so I think from a practical point of view, our discoveries uh, will lead to that. Another practical thing, which I don't know how long it will take, but I do think, and we've already touched on this, um, we should have underlying theories for education, pedagogy, for for psychology, for um for uh, you know all kinds of human endeavors, which today we don't, right? Today we just kind of guess and wing it and test, and and but you know we don't have any fundamental theories about what it means to be intelligent. What is what's the fundamental idea of a false belief? Um, 
uh, I think at the end of the century, we will all, everybody who's living at the end of the century, if they've been to school, will understand how their brain works in the same way they understand how their DNA works. It's uh, that level of detail. They understand how their brain works. They understand how they form beliefs. They understand what it takes to learn, what's happening in their head when they're learning, um, the physical uh, changes that are occurring. This will be sort of um, at least common knowledge for those who want to access it. Um, and so that will also change our world quite a bit. Um, uh, and um, I think ultimately, that's all in the century. Uh, ultimately, uh, I think um, the creation of intelligent machines will allow us to really explore the universe um, in ways that we couldn't do it as a purely biological species. So I, I kind of view it as I kind of view it as a turning point in humanity. I, it's it's kind of hard to ask, think of it, a more important question for human, our species, the human species, the human, you know, homo sapiens, um, than a point where before we understood how our brain works and a point now we, we now understand how our brain works. And, and that is going to really sort of foster this transition from being a bio, purely biological species of biological evolution to one where we control our future, um, we control our evolution. As we've talked about, we've covered a lot of deep topics here today, Josh. Yeah, wow. Well, that's yeah. That's, <laughs> that's what I love about getting to like, do this. You know, deep, deep philosophy today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I just drop people in the big Yeah, that's great. Right. Um, is there just like yeah? One last quick question: Is there someone, or are you working with people to build AI based on on your theory? Yeah. So my I run a, a company called Mementa, and it's a research company. We were all a bunch of neuroscientists a couple until a few years ago. Now we're mostly uh, machine learning people. And so we have started down this path. Um, we're working on it. We're not the only people working on it, but we're working on it based on the knowledge we have. And we think our knowledge about intelligence is, is, is pretty good compared to other people. Uh, we have a real theory of what's going on. Um, so uh, obviously I don't think my little company is gonna do all this. Um, so we're trying to act as a catalyst meaning we're trying, we're publishing our results. We're very open about everything we're doing. We're starting to get some really amazing results and some uh, some of the technology we're developing that's gonna impact the AI, today's AI, based on brain theory. Um, so we're putting together this, I think over the next, um, you know, 10, you know, you'll start seeing some really significant results uh, in the AI field probably within 10 years. And then certainly over the next 20, 30 years, it'll be a completely transformed field. Um, so we're working on it. We're trying to get other people working on it. That's why I wrote a book. That's why we publish our papers. That's why we go to conferences. Um, so we'll see how successful we are. Uh, but that's the plan. Well, I hope, yeah, I hope it's, uh, is it successful as you, you've laid out the possibilities for, for what, what we can do with this. So, um, yeah, Jeff, thanks so much for your time. Um, everybody check out, uh, the book, A Thousand Brains. Uh, I'll put the link for it and, um, all your, some of your other work in, uh, the description below for anyone who's, who's listening or watching, uh, to check you out. Thank you, Josh. No problem. That was great. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the podcast. Don't forget our sponsor, ExpressVPN, and my book, Brexit, The Establishment Civil War, can both be found in the links in the description below. And also, please like, share, and subscribe to this podcast. It's the best way to help us grow. Until next time, thanks for listening. around its enclosure. The child had fallen into that enclosure. Officials are now defending their actions. ABC's Alex. A few things I am not. I'm not a cat. I am not an institutional investor, nor am I a hedge fund. There's no panic selling. These people, you know, they may have bought at $4, sat through $400, went back to 40, went to 350, back down to 110, and they have not sold. All they've done is bought more. And there's no answer for that. There's no, they, they, you know, it, it is like art of war mastery by a bunch of idiots who should know better. And they're just, they're just like, I'm not fucking leaving. Fly me to the moon. Let me play among the stars. Let me see what spring is like on Jupiter and Mars. What's been happening on Reddit and in social media and in the marketplace has never been seen before. Uh, the short 70, 60, 80% of a company, let alone 140%, I think a lot of people universally believe something is wrong there. They're powerful, they want to stock higher. It's child's play. 
why ever sell into the maw of Wall Street? Yeah, Reddit bets. Why? 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 But everyone's wrong. It's like the big short again. Or more like the big short squeeze this time, right? So here we got the fox guarding the hen house. And one of the hens is complaining. The fox is out to kill us. And the farmer says, I'm sorry. The fox is in charge of the hen house. Whenever there is not billions, but like trillions of dollars involved in something, it I, I argue that nothing is off the table. The way they have absolutely cheated, stolen, robbed everyday people so all our hedge fund billionaire friends can get out and not get killed is one of the most remarkable, illegal, shocking robberies in the history of, in plain sight. Super Stonk and the other communities that have emerged are a hive mind, the likes of which we have never seen before. It's madness and brilliance, insanity and genius all rolled into one. It's very possible that Citadel will be gone in a few months. And, and not just Citadel, but the entire financial system has the potential to come crashing down. These crooks continue to gamble recklessly with the world economy, and this could be the moment that they finally get their justice. You got maybe 10 million people doing this who now own, you know, probably more than 100 million shares. And eventually, you know, they might own everything.